Q&A about Founder Institute. And please note that we are recording this webinar. Before I introduce you to tonight's esteemed panelists, I'd like to tell you a little bit more about Founder Institute. Founder Institute is the world's largest pre-seed accelerator. In the program, early stage entrepreneurs and teams build their business alongside a critical support network of startup experts that share equity in their success. And through a structured and challenging business building process that has helped alumni of Founder Institute rose over 950 US million dollars. Since its launch in Silicon Valley in 2009, the Founder Institute has created over 4,000 companies and $20 billion in shareholder value. For our upcoming spring semester, which begins in August 2020, we have a new vision to see Australia as a world leader for sustainability innovation and a mission to challenge 1,000 Australian founders to build enduring companies to solve the world's biggest problems. Now, the reason for our program success is simple. We find great people, we give them a devoted support network, and we put them through a structured growth process. So if you're interested in learning more about the Founder Institute and our upcoming semester, which begins in August, we will be running a Q&A on this Founder Institute at the conclusion of tonight's panel, which will be from 7.30. Now, if you have any questions for our fine panelists, please submit them by the Q&A feature on your Zoom screen. And I'd now like to invite and introduce our panelists for today. Firstly, we have Andrea Gartner, who is the founder and CEO of Chilix Ventures, investors in visionary young technology companies in Australia and New Zealand. Andrea is passionate about providing more investors, including women, with access to the exciting, high return asset class of startups and is equally keen to encourage confidence through education about good investment and risk mitigation. Gary Vasante is one of my colleagues and a general partner at Right Click Capital who invest and champion bold tech startup founders. Gary is an entrepreneur and an investor with over 30 years of local and international business experience. He started and grown five businesses in a variety of industries as well as having international corporate experience. Danny Messina heads the Impact Angel Network and Impact Investment Group, who believe there is an enormous opportunity to create positive social and environmental change by connecting seed stage impact startups with an active network of passionate impact investors. Damien has worked across financial services over the last 10 years. Tristan Cole is a co-founder of Sempo, whose mission is to build open ecosystems that connect financially isolated communities with each other and the global community. Sempo has raised money from a number of early stage investors in Australia and the United States. And Alan Jones is entrepreneur in residence at Remarkable Tech, which harnesses technology to build social and economic inclusion for people with disability. Alan works hands-on with founders of early stage startups, and new product development teams within large enterprises. He has experience founding and co-founding web and mobile startups since 95, as well as being a seed stage investor. So with this wonderful panel of experts, thank you very much for your time. Thank you for joining us on this Tuesday evening. I'd like to turn to Tristan who also seems to be a connoisseur of noise cancelling headphones, but we're going to ask him about his fundraising story. Tell us a bit about what stages your business has been at, the journey you've been on having raised funds. What was the process? Did you simply say open sesame and money came into your pocket? What did you have to do to get the investors to sign documents and give you the cold hard cash, Tristan? Sure, it's a pleasure to be here, um, Ben, and yeah, really excited to share a bit about um, our journey in raising funding. Um, so we started Sempo three years ago, uh, basically with the mission to help NGOs deliver cash transfer programs. So that's where you give people money instead of 
um, giving them things in you know humanitarian crisis. And I think you know we've seen with COVID nineteen just how important it is to be able to distribute money um, you know to vulnerable communities both here in Australia and and globally. Um, you know when we started, we actually raised uh, our first round of funding, and I mean for context, all of our round of rounds of funding to date from accelerator programs. But I'll give some sort of some uh, I guess insight into that. Um, the first mm. one was with H2 Ventures, um, and that was you know really just pre-product, just a team like myself and um, my other co-founder Nick. Um, you know we just had an idea, and it was very very early stage. Uh, we then did a bridge round uh, with Startmate or and Blackbird Ventures that was you know off the back of that on the on the you know yeah, very, very similar s- terms. Um, and that was going into into like the first round of you know we've got some customers we're starting to grow. Um, that was interesting because it was on the, on the same terms. The first time you create your company, it's like I mean it's just one of the most exciting things I think you can do. Um, you know, sign the first term sheet, and you know suddenly you're a real company with investors and you know an ESOP and all those things. I think we were really lucky because we set up. You know, H2 and, and, you know, Ben and Toby from H2 Ventures really helped us set it up right from the start. And I think doing that when you're, you know, starting a company, especially one that is going to be, or you hope is going to be VC backed is, is important because um, you just skip so many of the, the easy pitfalls around like setting up an ESOP or, you know, just all these like easy mistakes you can make. Um, and then like, I guess going just quickly into the, the next round of funding we did, which was in, you know, start of last year, actually, you know, we would went out to basically say, okay, we're going to, you know, we don't have heaps of traction, but we're, we've got enough to like prove out the initial customer base, customer base, the initial product, you know, we're a lean team, both of uh, the found, you know, both myself and my other founder are technical. So we didn't need to like hire, um, you know, a lot of people. So it was, you know, let's go out and raise a a pre-seed round. So that actually turned into, uh, a program in the US uh, called D Lab and and you know an early stage investor called SOSV. Um, so we went over to New York for six months there. Um, but we also raised some funding from um, a few other founders, like the the founder of Afterpay, Anthony, and and um, uh, a few other like seed stage investors here in Australia. So we viewed it as like a pre seed round that was part of an accelerator program. But for us, it was very much like you know we'd done enough accelerators we were there because we really liked the the team in um, New York. And, you know, we still actually speak to one of the the guys there on a weekly basis, which we find really useful. Um, so I that's guess, yeah, that's like so, our journey, but yeah. So, so, so when you receive money from folks like Anthony and some of these other angels, at what mm. stage was your business, Tristan? Uh, that was a little later stage. I mean, that was early last year or so. You know, we'd have, we had revenue, we had initial customers, we had like Oxfam as a customer, um, you know, that was a program funded by the Australian government. We had Mercy Corps as a customer. So a few like, you know, top 10 ent- international NGOs, which was, you know, relevant to us because it's like, that's our customer base. Um, mm. So it was definitely, you know, a bit later stage, but, you know, business model hadn't been proven out. You know, it's, there's still a lot of work that needs to be done. Um, so I guess you've got to decide like when you're raising funding, like what stage you like, can you build the initial product yourself, the MVP? Can you, you know, close customers yourself at the start? Like, you know, what are you raising this money for as well is really important to know because I think, you know, we've gone into funding rounds before and we've been uncertain about like what we're using this money for. And I think investors can, they kind of like, they kind of know you know, they'll be able to like just call things as it is straight away. So you need to be like, you know, I've got, I'm using, you know, $250,000 for engineering. I'm using, you know, 250000 for XYZ. Like I think having really clear goals to why you're raising that money as well is really important. Great. Thanks for sharing that story. Before we go into some more questions, I have a poll. And Phoebe, if we're able to bring up this first question, and this poll is, at what stage is your startup? So we're hoping to get a sense of 
the complexion of the stage that your 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 startup is at, so that we can ensure that our answers are customised for you. So, have you not started? Are you pre-product? Are you post-product? Maybe you're like Tristan at his last round, generating a bit of revenue at the customer or so. If you can pop that answer in, and then in a moment, we should be able to see the results. This reminds me of the worm. You remember that when you had those election debates and you could see the worm going up when the politicians said some nice things and then <laughs> when not so nice things were said, the, the worm went down. Okay, someone said, not a startup, here to learn. That's completely fine. Okay, so. It looks like the majority have not started or are pre-product. If I have that together, that's what sixty percent. And then some people are post-product and generating revenue. There you go. So the majority are pre-product, but there's a similar amount who are, have not started post-product and generating revenue. Thank you very much for for answering that. So one of the one of the questions that has 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 just come up, and I appreciate questions, Sajid. And maybe we'll, we'll send this to, to Andrea's way. Right now, if you are wanting to go and raise money at a very early stage, and Tristan was talking about he raised money at a relatively early stage going into one of these programs, what would you say at the, the moment is the minimum that you need to show to, to raise money from someone who's not your mum or dad or, or, or grandpa to, to to give your business a leg up? Good question. Um, I think it actually, different investors invest at different stages. Um, probably not in principle different things, but progress, uh, different levels of progress. We invest pretty early, um, roughly around the angel stage. So sort of pre and early revenue. Um, it'd take quite a bit to invest pre-product again for us, I think. Uh, Pre-MVP, I'm not sure. Yeah, we would have to be really, really impressed and excited, I think. Um, so I think we want to actually see something, um, at least an MVP. We want to see some, I mean, we'd love to see some evidence of product market fit that was really firm, like some revenue. But if we're not looking at revenue, we need some other evidence that there, there will be some, that there is some sort of product market fit. Um, mm. We're looking for um, evidence of, you know, the calibre of the founders, because ultimately at that really early stage, what we're really, really investing in it really is the, cal is the founders, um, because they're going to have to, at that early stage, there's going to be a lot of iteration and changes of directions along the way and they've got to be the sort of people that can make those changes appropriately as required they've got to have a really um, for us they need to have a pretty voracious appetite to learn um, and you know that willingness to kind of acknowledge what the kind of skill gaps are because they're the things that that you know would want to see um, funds to be used to fill um, so we're looking for, you know, the caliber of the founders, some evidence of product market fit. Um, and, and for us, it absolutely has to be looking, you know, put that technology has to be providing a strong competitive advantage in a really huge global market. So mm. that's roughly what we're looking at. Um, and I think that, uh, you know, in these times, it's, I think bootstrapping is good um, in principle to get as far as you can uh, without taking funding because um, that way you're sort of managing your own dilution. Hopefully you'll be able to raise it. The more progress you can make, the better, the, um, the easier it will be to raise and, um, and uh, the less you'll be diluted. And investors want you to be, they don't, you know, they don't want to see you too diluted because, you know, we want to see you um, incentivized to, knock your pan in to grow your business, really. Mm, mm. Okay, look, thank you very much for that perspective. Gary, you've had experience investing in companies at various stages. How would you view the, the, the key metrics or prerequisites before raising funding at some of those stages? Sure. So, look, uh, for pre-revenue businesses, uh, they're 
you know, there can be uh, metrics for, uh, for traction uh, that relate to, I guess, activity uh, or uh, survey work uh, around uh, identifying if there's sort of market potential. Uh, there's obviously not going to be, um, well, usually there's, there's uh, no sort of uh, growth metrics related to, to revenue. Uh, there could be metrics related to customers uh, if you aren't actually selling anything at the moment. Uh, but we focus um, very, very much on the team first for pre-revenue business. Uh, if there are other uh, growth metrics there, we look at that. Obviously, the idea is important. Uh, but team uh, trumps uh, everything when it's pre-revenue. Uh, as soon as the business has started actually selling something, then uh, traction trumps everything else. It's really just around uh, the growth of the business, the velocity of the business, and um, how quickly the founders are, uh, are peddling and, and growing. Right. Okay. Thank you. And I think we there, there was a question that I saw earlier that someone had asked. Is there an ideal growth rate for a startup when, when, when looking for funding? And I think Ben was asking the question here that this is for a startup that's generating revenue. So the, the fourth option with the, with the questions that we had before. Who wants to take this? Alan. Yeah. Knock it, uh, knock it out ben, of the park. Knock it out of the park. There's been uh, a few references lately to accelerator stage startups and how fast they should be growing to be considered mm. thriving. And uh, in programs like Y Combinator and Techstars, mm. the expected growth rate is 10% month on month. Mm -hmm. So you might be able to achieve 10% growth from July to August one time, but then August to September, 10% on the 10% you grew the previous month is quite a bit more. Go keep that up for 12 months, and that 10% increase every month is really big, you know. So, when we talk about in startups about how you have to start by doing things that don't scale, like you won't win any customers, you won't get any deals done unless you start out by doing things that don't scale, but then very quickly you have to figure out how to replicate those things in a way that does scale because investors are looking for some sort of growth metric around about 10% month on month to be world class. Here in Australia, I think we, we cut you a bit of slack and, and we might be delighted to see something between, in these current economic conditions, we might be hoping to see maybe between five and 10% month on month growth. But that's customer growth and revenue growth. That's not team growth or social media followers growth or anything like that. Customers and revenue in these times, those are, yes. those are all the aces in the deck. Yes, so, so Alan, when you when you make mention and, and, and and, and, and Damien, please feel free to, to, to answer too. When you say 10% month on month, how many months in a row would you want to see this? Is, is it two months or do you need a hat trick? Do you need three months? Like, well, what, what are we talking about? Well, I, th I think the challenge right now, particularly at, at, at angel and pre-seed stage, is that the, I think the, the heat is coming right off the angel investors in the community and they're going, whoa, hold on a second. Not really sure what's going to happen. Is Kanye West going to win the election in November? Uh, <laughs> how's it going to affect what happens, you know, to my startup? Kim business? Kardashian, so, eat your heart out. Yeah. Yeah, and so I think a big challenge for most people is that is that that at that first stage of investment, most investors are just like taking their foot off the accelerator pedal and saying, "Show me another month of ten percent growth." Like I love that you did that once. Show me if you can do it again, and show me, you know. And so, if you can drag them by the table, by drag them to the table by by saying, well, you know, we've got a lead, we've got three others, and there's enough allocation left in the round that you could still get in, then you'll get them in, you know. But I would say at the moment, twelve to eighteen months is probably a, a reasonable expectation, um, and I've, I've seen you know those sorts of those sorts of time frames, twelve to eighteen months. Even when you're, so when you're a, progressing, a year or so, yeah. a year or so of track record to show that this ain't just a, a one-shot wonder, or it was a, a lucky, a lucky quarter. Yeah, I would say five percent or more per month for a, a good long right. sustained period. Yeah. Okay, I think that's that, that's helpful, Damien. You look after the impact angel network as part of Impact Investment Group, who we we, we know well and appreciate the, the good work you've been doing there. 
we've been speaking a lot of these about financial metrics, whether it's on the revenue side, and Andrea was talking, I think, about uh, market size, woman after my own heart, who doesn't want a large market? <laughs> you deal with impact investments. And can you share with us what, what, is, what is the lens that you run to, to, to either have an investment that you're excited by, or at least with, which is within your, within your wheelhouse, and then what are the perhaps social impacts or other impacts that you measure? And, and, and how, do you, how do you do that? And do, you, do, you, do you have a thermometer or some kind of special tool to, to figure this out? Yeah, I, I wish it was that easy. And if we, if we knew where there was a thermometer, we'd probably invest in it. I think um, <laughs> Wells has acknowledged that impact measurement is extremely difficult. Um, and I, I especially think that has um, accelerated in the last few years as impact washing has become more and more of a thing. Uh, in impact in, at the Impact Investment Group and kind of the Giant Leap Fund and the Impact Angel Network, we broadly look for what we call um, embedded impact. And so what that means is it's, it's impact that can't be stripped out of the business model. Mm -hmm. uh, during turbulent times. So that rightly or wrongly is the position that we take, but it, it, the impact that we're creating needs to be at the core of the very value proposition that the company is looking to execute. Um, we've found, and, and I think it's pretty well documented that throughout COVID, uh, ESG related stuff has outperformed traditional investment um, I think mm. there's probably something in that. And we did hold a pretty good group talk around what we thought was driving that. And I think the group consensus came back to the idea that during turbulent times or periods where people are uh, a little bit scared or, or uncertain, um, people really reevaluate what they consider to be important, what they consider to be essential. And I think in, um, in an impact context, is probably not too much more important than you know society and the environment and so we we found mm. that either through the chicken or the egg situation of consumer behavior or investment appetite um, there seems to be a pretty good um, sentiment in that space we certainly found that on the on the angel network when we put it to investors um, they were actually looking at the um, at the turbulence and what how that was playing out in the early stage um, sector and they and they were quite bullish on on where that landed. Um, lots of you know lots of people citing that it would would often accelerate um, the success of the good ideas or accelerate um, you know the, the demise of the not so good ideas. Mm. And also mm. citing that it, it it was a time where founder resilience as well as um, I guess as well as found, founder adaptability was going to become. Um, quite easy to deduce, and mm. so we we found it as uh, an active period more than a slow right. period. Thank you. And one one follow up question, Damien, when you think of a, a return, and of course we look at our term deposits that you get from the banks these days. It's not much of a return you you get there, but let's say let's say you you you're chasing a return of ten percent per year. In your view, when people are making a decision to invest in impact, are they sometimes trading off a financial return, say the 10%, so that the 10% might be 8% of cash return with the recognition that there will be 2% or perhaps more than 2% of the social impact return? Oh, big question. I don't think we've got enough time to answer that one. But the, oh, the, wow. the, the reality is, I think um, there's a common misconception that impact investing does not deliver commercial returns. And I think mm -hmm. that can be debunked conclusively. Um, again, I think there's a wealth of information that suggests that it's on par, um, if not exceeding um, industry standards. I think where where I guess additional consideration needs to take place is there's undoubtedly some ideas which have less um, appealing returns and mm -hmm. more, um, I guess, social and environmental returns, and they still have a space. 
And so on the Angel Network, we, we're very clear around, um, you know, the investment decision fundamentally sits with the angels. And, and if an angel sees value in a solution beyond the commercial return, it's entirely their prerogative to, to invest. We won't not promote that idea um, through the Angel Network. We, we, we will still pass that through for the investor to determine where that balance is. I see. So what I'm hearing you say is that it's very much in the eye of the beholder if they believe that, say, there is an additional social impact return that is on top of a financial return, fantastic, but that value might be perceived differently from one investor to another and therefore you give that autonomy to them. Correct. In the angel space, in the fund space, we're generally because it, it is a it is a fund. We're looking we're looking for the returns that match what the promise was. Okay, that's very helpful. Look, thank you very much for putting in your questions. I'm seeing a whole bunch of these questions here, and I think there was a question that Gary wanted to answer. Did you want to have a shot with that? Or, oh, actually, Alan has answered it. Fantastic, Paul Henri. Wonderful. That 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 has been. That has been answered about traction trumping everything. Wonderful. That's that that is great. Let's 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 move down to a, another question that's been asked by an attendee. This is an anonymous attendee. How do startups get incorporated and raise capital while staying compliant with ASIC rules such as the two twelve twenty rule? Is this a burdensome part of the process for new companies? Does anyone want to take this one? Or am I going to put my non-legal legal hat on? It looks like I'm going to put my hat on. I've just opened a little, a little box here. Look, startups can get incorporated very easily. There are all sorts of people, whether they're accountants, lawyers, or incorporation services. In fact, ASIC itself will allow you to incorporate with them. So the, the, the issue is the capital raising. I think the, the question is, under the ASIC rules, there, are a limit, there is a limitation that within a period of 12 months, a company, I understand, can raise a maximum of $2 million from 20 people in a 12-month period, hence the 2-12-20 rule, from, from retail investors, which is mums and dads. So in other words, you can't go and raise more than that amount from, 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 from more people in a 12-month period by knocking on doors without being licensed. So that is to, to protect the mums and dads from possibly putting money into your business. I think the rules are different if you are raising money from sophisticated investors or if you use someone to, to help you through that process. And that's how crowdfunding platforms get around this 2-12-20 rule. So generally speaking, I think, Tristan, you, you, you've you certainly raised a, a, a chunk of money and that has come through accelerators who are, who are in some way sophisticated investors who are able to, to write money into your company. Okay, thank you very much. Let's go through uh, another question. Has your investment thesis changed since COVID, Andrea? No. <laughs> no, it no, hasn't. That's for sure. Well, you know, we're, okay. we're still looking for the same things, but um, I will say that I actually feel really uh, quite excited about the investment opportunities um, generated. At, at, and investing environment really uh, as a result of COVID. Um, I think, mm. you know, you, you noted in the right capitals, um, what, what did you call a deal book report? That, yes. You know, the, the existing gap at the seed fu funding stage, which is not great for our ecosystem and it's not great for founders, but that gap at that angel investment stage, that sort of pre-seed and seed stage, um, seems to be actually have been ex exacerbated by the crisis. Um, mm. that, that's kind of, you know, selfishly, it's kind of good for investors. It creates opportunity. There's been downward pressure on valuations in a lot of cases that also creates opportunity, particularly in the context of a, a you know, I, I believe that um, generally very early stage 
startups are pretty much overvalued. You have kind of uh, fueled by emotion, and you know you get uh, pre-revenue with you know sometimes pre-MVP at a four million dollar valuation. There's actually nothing there other than a couple of founders and a sort of a, a plan. Um, so I think there are lots of opportunities. I think. The, you know, Ray Dalio, the um, billionaire founder of Bridgewater, has done a lot of research uh, recently on um, the best investments during, uh, at the, the, the best performing investments in the depression and the deepest recessions. And um, it was interesting, you know, there's sort of meat and potatoes like Campbell Suits and the other one was um, innovative technology that allows adaptation to the new world order. And I think mm. there would probably be a new world order um, as a result of this pandemic, I think the way people work will change. There's a lot of things that I think, you know, will change. And I think that creates fabulous investment opportunities for us. You know, mm. in, in startups that are actually um, sort of providing that technology to actually adapt. Yeah. Gary, any comments on investment theses changing or particular yeah. sectors of focus? Oh. The right to capital, our um, investment thesis hasn't changed at all uh, through COVID. Uh, we're still engaging with lots of very early stage founders. Uh, we haven't seen any evidence of um, any uh, devaluations uh, or, or expectations there uh, from other investors. We haven't seen that locally yet in the founders that we've been looking at and the, the opportunities we've been looking at. Um, I actually think that uh, there's going to be uh, many new startups that have been created, uh, I guess, from, from March uh, going on. So I think there are a lot of people that are working from home and probably hustling away now on side projects. Uh, there are many people that have lost their jobs that are also now going to be working on uh, new projects. And I think we'll see um, a lot of startups uh, being birthed probably next year. And, mm. uh, you know, we are still seeing um, a similar level of activity uh, from founders now that we were seeing pre-COVID. So it feels reasonably business as usual. Uh, mm. I think that pre-revenue startups as well uh, are still able to uh, obtain funding. Uh, probably, uh, it's probably easier for them uh, than... Uh, startups that have actually started producing revenue. I think once you start producing revenue, there's an expectation of growth. And if you're not quite there yet, uh, and you're still in the very early stages, um, it's still possible to raise money. And we've seen lots of founders uh, trying to do that. Mm, okay, thank you for that response. And Damien, there's a question here that I think you might be helpful in providing a, an answer to, and then I'll turn to you, Tristan. So for you, Damien, given clean tech startups typically have long development times and high capital requirements, does this make them a less attractive investment than other sectors? Um, I think my answer to that is no. It doesn't make them less attractive. I think they attract a certain profile of investor. So I think investor sentiment is kind of very, it can be quite specific and niche to specific segments. And I know that um, I work with many angel groups that, that um, specialize in this space, just like we work with um, other angel groups that specialize in other spaces. So I don't necessarily think it's, it's as easy as saying yes or no. Um, it's different. Mm. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Tristan, a lot of focus on government intervention is on small business. Is there any pressure that you might be aware of that might be focused or support, maybe that's the, the, the comment being asked, that might be focused specifically on startups? Um, I am not aware of anything specifically on startups. I know that the job keeper package was um, you know, targeted at all businesses in Australia and you know, there was some concessions, I believe, by the ATO on like high growth companies that saw a, like a big decline. Um, but I, I'm not 100% sure at the top of my head. I mean, there is a lot of, like, I think if you're in a startup right now and, you know, if you're, strugg you're struggling with growth and you're not receiving government money in some way, whether that's like tax R&D, export development grant, 
um, other government grants. Like we won an EU grant with one of our customers um, just last week, actually, a million euros from the European Commission. Like if you're not receiving government money in some way, I think you're doing it wrong, really, because, you know, there is a lot of cash like flowing around. Um, you know, they're printing a lot of money and there's like a lot of cash going in. I think, you know, like even the New South Wales MVP grant, you know, I remember we received that and that really helped us a lot. Um, you know, it wasn't a particularly hard process to go through, but it was, you know, a lot of people just couldn't be bothered nearly. Mm. Um, so there is maybe not, I, I don't, I'm probably not the best person to answer for that because I don't not like as switched on, on, on those things, but I think like it's, there is cash going like out there at the moment for small businesses. Get the free money, I say. Alan, uh, yeah. <laughs> a quick question for you. Thanks, Tristan. Alan, as a technical engineer and developer, what have you found is the best way to identify business partners to help with their startups or MVPs? This is an anonymous attendee. Well, first of all, I'm excited to hear somebody with a technical background. Um, yeah! Think about... Yeah, first of all, it's, just, it's always exciting to meet somebody technical, there's so few in Australia. Um, but it's also exciting to hear somebody um, from a technical background who's already recognising that this is not just about building technology, right? So I have a little poster on a wall in another room in my house which says, most tech startup founders I meet are somewhere on the journey from thinking that this is all about building great technology to understanding this is actually a lot to do with sales and marketing. Um, so you know there are lots of examples of great products that engineers have built and, and they are technically excellent and they solve the problem better than the, than the existing solution um, and then they fail to find market adoption and usually for no good logical reason because humans don't behave logically you know if if, if humans only decided to buy things for logical reasons nobody would ever buy a can of coke or a packet of cigarettes or an energy drink <laughs> You know, or a hundred and fifty thousand dollar four door sedan when you can get by it with one for twenty eight thousand. You know, so <clears throat> uh, it's often a challenge for those of us with an engineering mindset to appreciate that that most people make purchasing decisions for irrational reasons. So um, it's unclear from from uh, the person's question when they say business partners whether they mean someone like uh, uh, contractors or co-founders or external you know, service providers. So it's a little bit difficult to tell, but I would say in general, um, you can often pick, cherry pick great talent out of a service agency if you can find something to be inspired about your particular vision and the problem that you're solving and the customer you're solving it for. So I, I would consider every interaction with a freelancer or a contractor or some kind of professional service agency as an opportunity to potentially find some of them might be a member of your team at some point. But equally, if you find somebody who's just, you know, if you're trying to find somebody to do a particular role in your role, in your, in your startup, I think you should address it about the same way. So you should start out with a tightly defined small unit of work that they can complete in a short period of time. Um, and, and the tighter your definition, the more likely you are to be able to accurately def to determine whether or not that person's actually done the work that you asked them to or that they've misunderstood what you asked for and wasted your time and days doing something which was not quite right. You know, so I think a lot of people miss out on gigs and startups because they were poorly briefed. You know, the, the project mm. was, was, was poorly briefed. So I would like you to, to work with a really tight brief um, and check in with the person before they begin the work to establish whether they really understand what you want or they're just smiling and nodding their head and grateful to get the opportunity, you know? So complete a number of small, tightly scoped pieces of work with them. And then if that's going well, then start to extend the scope and be lucid with the brief and encourage that person to feedback to you what they think they should be doing to achieve the goal that you have together. And then that person gradually, hopefully goes from project-based work to regular part-time work to regular full-time work for the company. And at some point, maybe they qualify for, for some employee share option plan. Um, and then it might take three, four years, but maybe one day you sit down with a person and you say, you know, you're such an awesome member of the team. And I feel like sometimes like me, you go home on a Friday night and you're up until 11 PM thinking about like the long-term means of this business as much as I am. So, I want to, have to start this conversation now about maybe one day you actually stepping up and, and becoming part of a leadership team. 
So that might be a five year journey to get to somebody who's a co-founder, a peer and equal in the business. But look, the, you know, the alternative is you pick the wrong person. <laughs> you have a couple of copies of somebody, you don't really understand what they do, they don't really understand what you do. You end up giving a meaningful chunk of equity in your business away. And then that person becomes a barnacle on the side of your boat. You know, they are slowing you down the whole time you are there and you do not have the leverage that you need to get rid of them. You keep pitching your business to investors and they see this stranger on the, on the, on the cap table they've never heard of before and, uh, and they want to know who that person is and they want them to hell gone before they're prepared to invest in your company. So again, that barnacle is slowing your boat down. And at the end of the day, getting rid of that person, you know, this has been a, just like a marriage and just like a marriage, it can be emotionally and financially painful to, to split up. Um, so it's really worth the time to start slowly and, and with small, closely defined units of work and then build that out over time until you're both confident that this is a relationship that you should mm. you know, formalize. Long answer, sorry, I hope that helps. Thank you, thank you, Alan. I now want to turn and change, change, change gear. How do you meet and work with different sources of capital? So how might you find different sources of capital and how much you work with them. So we've often heard about family and friends, angel investors, venture capitalists, government grants. Tristan, what would be your advice for folks who are wanting to go and meet and work with some of these different sorts of capital? Um, I mean, I think it's just like at the start, you are trying to, you know, if you're new to the industry, like let's say you're in the vertical of like real estate, just choosing something you know, random. You're doing mm. like a prop tech startup. You want to be like meeting with the experts in that industry and, and like upskilling yourself really, really fast. Um, you know, they'll point you to potential people who are run technology companies in the industry before, or, you know, just learning more about it. Um, you know, you want to find other investors, especially angel investors who are in a similar industry. You know, for us, it's payments. So getting people on our cap table who have experience in the payments business was like critical. Um, you know, I think that's something um, when it comes to family and friends, I mean, we've kind of avoided it on purpose. Um, for us, like it was accelerator programs, early stage accelerator programs who, you know, were willing to back us pre-product. Um, and then the other one, yeah, government grants, I think is, I mean, that's something that I think not enough companies nearly take a, mm. take advantage of it. I mean, you know, they're there for a reason. Like if you're in a, if you're doing, again, this is like a, a you know, to Damien's point, this is a good reason why you should be doing something in impact because there is just so many more government grants um, available for startups to get started, to be doing work in, you know, clean tech, financial inclusion, like all these different avenues, there is a lot of government money in that because they're trying to encourage more, you know, socially oriented, um, social impact businesses, which I think is great. Um, mm. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Damien, how do you like getting your deal flow? Uh, so most of our deal flow comes through the fund, but we often are out um, just in any forums we can be meeting founders and um, often watching pitches. So there's no real one particular avenue that we go about, um, but there is an application form through the fund that will, will end up on the network. Oh, cool. How about you, Gary? Yeah, so look, How we, about... yeah, uh, we uh, have a, uh, an elaborate process for trying to identify founders uh, and, and startups to invest into. Uh, we get a lot of, uh, contact just directly coming into the fund and that's as a result of uh, all of the fund members being out there and very active in the ecosystem doing events like this uh, participating in judging competitions uh, giving presentations and we tend to meet lots of founders it's a great way for us to begin building relationships uh, we also have our own uh, processes for going out and identifying uh, new founders, new startups, exciting businesses, and we go and specifically target them once we uh, learn about them. So, uh, you know, it's a combination of um, founders finding us and us finding founders. Thanks, Gary. And how do you find your, your deals? How do they come to you, Andrea? 
Um, well, we have uh, about 600 direct applications a year, and we also have about a thousand um, applications that we vet with uh, together with Innovation Bay. So turning it around a little bit in terms of just advice to the audience, um, mm. my suggestions are that be one, be really aware of who you're pitching. So do your homework. Don't make sure that, you know, at least go onto people's websites and find, um, event, potential investors' websites and find out you know, get some idea of whether there's a reasonable prospect of there being um, a fit. Is your startup the type of thing that they're, they're likely to want to invest in? Um, and try and get a soft introduction from someone that mm. you know. And, you know, they really do help. I mean, the best introductions, the ones that we love the most, really come from our portfolio founders and, uh, and then probably other investors. Uh, people that we know and respect and you know if they're already investing that you know that makes us pay a little bit more attention and just be very aware that you know say for us we're, we're a small uh, venture capital company but you know we do see we you know we're a small team looking at 15 to 1600 applications a year so we give them a pretty the first look is fairly cursory it's yep mm. yep oh that one looks interesting I'll have a look at that yep yep um, and just so just be very targeted with your reach out, make sure that it's just very quick and easy for the investor to understand what you're doing and why you're doing it and how you're doing it and the value of it, you know, just really, really quickly. Um, and bear in mind that that first contact is really to hook the interest of the investor. It's not to get the sale over the line. It's just... It's the bait. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's quick enough interest so that we want to find out more. It's that engagement is really key. Um, so don't over, overwhelm people with too much information. It just sort of, I think that goes, we'll ask for it when we want it. Great. So do okay, thanks. This is my big thing. <laughs> no, thank you. Thank you very much. Panellists, it's just going to turn 7.25 in a moment and we have nine questions that I'd like to get answered. So we're going to have to be disciplined about this. So let's talk about numbers. What's a good number of users, let's say, for app you are seeking investment for that would be regarded as decent traction? Who knows what decent traction is? But this is from Drew for a 250,000K investment. Who'd like to take this? What's a good number of users, let's say for an app you're seeking investment for that be regarded as decent traction for a 250k investment? Quick fire response, but true. So it depends on what kind of uh, customers, right? So are they paying customers? Are they using an app for free? Um, and, and what's the growth rate in that number of customers month on month? So if you're going to build something that's going to be as big as Instagram one day, then that 250k round you know, could, could be great, even if those are free users. But if uh, if you're not on that kind of trajectory, then uh, it's going to be hard to raise much money for, you know, an app that people use for free. Thank you, Alan. We've got another one from Ivan. Is it possible to raise money where, where my startup is based, which is in Indonesia, but I'm now working out of Australia? I'm working here to fund my team in Indonesia. My startup has been formed two years ago. We've validated our idea. We've been running our marketing since last year. Gary, do you want to be of assistance yeah, sure. to Ravan? So, look, I think it's it's definitely possible to raise money here. Uh, I'm assuming that your startup is actually uh, domiciled or registered in Indonesia. Uh, it's possible but difficult. And most Australian VC funds... Uh, and certainly most Australian angel investors uh, probably have more comfort in investing in Australia domiciled businesses. Uh, so, you know, there's, there's options there. You could think about uh, possibly, uh, if you're living here permanently, to relocate your business into Australia. That may make it easier, but um, yeah, certainly there are options. Okay, thank you. Another quick one from Paul Henri, and this is for, for you, Damien, I think. In the current COVID environment, if in the same city, do you prefer having face-to-face -face intro chats at a distance, of course, or do you prefer Zoom? 
Uh, I think for me, I'm a people's person, so I always prefer face-to-face, -face, although the practicality um, of Zoom and kind of the widespread adoption means that it's becoming more and more commonplace. So my preference is in, in person, but I'm, I'm not phased um, with Zoom either. Okay, cool. Tristan, are you factoring in another COVID-style impact to your business in the future? <laughs> if so, how? <laughs> Two pandemics in a row. Yeah, <laughs> uh, not directly. I mean, I think no one expected like this, you know, once in a generation kind of event to happen. Um, but, you know, we're, we've certainly reeled in like our own costs internally. Like while there's a lot of uncertainty in the market, like just being careful on, you know, hiring and like focusing on getting to like cash flow even. I think that gives you like more options as a, as a company. If you can fund yourself, then at the very least, you can either decide to reinvest in growth or, you know, go raise venture capital. There's just a lot more flexibility. Um, so mm. I think just being careful with spending is, is important. Great. Okay. We're going to move on to another one. I, I reckon we can do this. There's, there's, there's five more here and I'm confident with our concentration and the brain power of our panelists, we can deliver significant value. So from Ruggiero, what type of traction are investors looking for in startups in sectors that have been heavily affected by COVID, perhaps travel or education. Who wants to take this? Gary? Yeah, so look, I think it's it's not a simple question to just uh, relate back to traction. Um, it, it really has to be uh, thought through around uh, uh, how much money a business has to continue operating. Uh, it, it's, it's not a, a simple uh, quantitative answer there. Uh, so, yeah, okay. not a great answer from me, but uh, it's, it's a difficult question to just answer simply. There are a lot of factors. Yes. One thing every investor will try and do is, is pick the right time to invest. And so an investor would be really bold to be investing in a travel or a hospitality startup at this time, given we don't know how long lockdowns are going to be affecting different geographies across the world and how big the economic effects of the recession are going to be. Um, so an investor who's interested in investing in travel and hospitality would probably be looking to do that when they started to feel confident that the worst of it was over, because then they'll probably be able to invest at companies in, in that sector at a, at a much lower valuation. You know, there'll be less competition mm. and, and, and you've got a better chance of, of, of growing attraction from that point. And I think just generally the investors are still uh, thinking with a, a medium to longer term view. So uh, these are hiccups that we're all going through uh, and it's really about the longer game. Yeah. Yeah. A lot, lot longer term view. I've got a double barrel question here. How do you consider investments that may compete with existing portfolio companies? And part B, as investors, do you actively look for companies that might partner with your existing portfolio, i.e. What, what they could bring or technology market services the portfolio needs could, could, could offer? Who wants to take this? Have a crack. Um, I think um, it, it would be really great if uh, startups in my portfolio were comfortable with me investing in, in other startups that might potentially be competitors because, you know, it would be great for me as an investor because I could take all the things that I've learned from the companies already in my portfolio and apply that to the companies joining my portfolio. But I understand why my portfolio companies might be a bit reluctant. Um, and I definitely would be good for my reputation. Uh, so I'd love to be able to specialise more probably on, on, on the things that I love and less on the things that are just investing because they're, you know, good investments. Uh, yeah. You know, it, it comes down to that basically. You've, you've got to protect the companies in your portfolio first. Yeah. But I would always have a conversation. Like I think if there's, if there's a potential for conflict of interest, I, I would discuss it with each party individually and see if we can make it work. I don't generally look for synergies between startups and my portfolio um, because, you know, if partnerships don't work, again, it's like a marriage and that divorce could be really bad for two companies in my portfolio instead of for one. Mm. Yeah, I'll just jump in there as well. Uh, we typically uh, don't invest in competing companies in our portfolio. And, yeah, I agree with Alan that 
Uh, you know, it's great to look for synergies, but uh, as an investor, uh, we don't push them uh, too hard. And if they're naturally there, uh, you know, we'll, we'll facilitate them, but we don't push them very hard. Mm. Okay, we've just got two more, I think. So as a early stage investor, Andrea, are you, how comfortable are you with remote only or work from home startup teams? Oh, I'm pretty comfortable because I think everybody's doing it at the moment. And, you know, for example, we've got four investments that we've got that we're, we're kind of likely to do in the next month. And um, we haven't met any of them. They're all working from home. You know, all their teams are working from home. Um, so, yeah, I mean, ideally... You meet people, but at the moment, that's challenging. Uh, but I, I think if the, the team was working from home and it was um, and it was planned that that was going to continue, you know, you probably part of your due diligence would be looking at you know how well and how effect, how well that's managed and how effective it is. Mm, okay, and just one last question that I'll. I'll, I'll see which panellist wants to take this. Hitesh has identified three exciting projects with very good sales and profit potential based on market and customer research. The market size is huge with global application. These projects are in the area of applying artificial intelligence in medicine. Funding required is between three and $10 million over three years for product development and clinical trials. Would you suggest the types of investors that may have appetite for returns over four to five years in the healthcare tech space? Any suggestions? The one thing I'd say is that four to five years pre-product and it's AI in the medical space, that sounds a really ambitious timeline. Yeah. Particularly with clinical trials thrown in there as well. Yeah, so. and all the regulatory stuff. It's, you know, the sort of medical stuff, med tech, you know, they have pretty long... Uh, life um, yep. and to I think to invest early I mean what worries me there is there's a you know very good sales and profit potential based on market and customer research where's the technical you know it sounds quite technical if you're talking about AI um, you know that's a pretty big risk I think yeah, look, I'll, I'll just make a general comment there that investors typically don't invest in ideas or yeah. pre businesses so uh, there are a lot of people running around with great ideas and great vision and investors usually like to see a prototype or an MVP so that would be I think a big barrier for uh, what you've just described there that's right I mean they um, you know to, we often say as investors we often say you know ideas are a dime a dozen it's capacity to execute that we're looking for yep Look, panelists, thank you so much. Kind of... Oh, sorry, sorry, Alan, please. Sorry, I was going to say, if you've got a world-class team um, that has track record at, at solving problems like that and built similar startups, um, then that would be great. But otherwise, uh, go and do a friends and family round, see if you can get 50K together or 30K or 20K and, and prove that you can do something useful with that money and then with that track record then go and see if you can raise 100k from some angels or get into a, even better an accelerator program because um, that's going to help you with market awareness as well prove that you can you can deploy 100k of capital really well and then you work your way up to one and a half mil three mil and so on yes the the stepped approach well look we've just approached 7 35 p.m and that's the conclusion of tonight's panel for rethinking startup funding post c19 we're going to keep this room open for any additional questions that you might have about founder institute and if you want to ask me some funding questions i'm happy to stick around for another 10 or 15 minutes so i'd like to thank everyone for joining us today and a special thanks to andrea to gary to damien tristan and to alan for sharing of their time and expertise and our goal has been to give you an update on startup funding post C19, to provide some practical tips on how you can increase getting your increase your chances of getting funding, and then also to, to share some stories on, on, on some successes. So thanks for joining us and we'll farewell our 
panellists at this time and attendees, if you wish to stay on, I will be very happy to take additional questions about Founder Institute as well as funding related questions. Thank you very much. Thank you. Good Thanks so much for having us, Gary. Thanks. Thanks, panellists. <laughs> so I think there was... Thanks, Al. Thank you. So I think there was a question that an, an, an attendant asked, uh, that an attendee rather asked about staying on top of grants. My my experience has been some of the, the government sites do have a bunch of these government programs, I, I think on australia.gov.au, but I agree it, it can be very difficult because the grants can sometimes be launched by uh, Council, other times they're launched by uh, state government, and other times they are federal government grants. And various grants will, different grants will have, have different requirements for, the, for, for eligibility and, 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 and also accessibility. Any other questions? Hit me up in the Q and A. Really happy to take all of your questions. Oh, I'm sure, Adam, that we could get a recording available for um, for, for some of the, the FI crew. Yes, I'm sure. Hit 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 me up, and we'll we'll make it happen. The program application deadline. I understand, and for our upcoming Founder Institute program, it is going to have an early bird deadline of the 19th of July. So if you're interested in taking part in the upcoming semester of the Founder Institute, which is going to have a sustainability focus, and that means there'll be three special modules, three special modules delivered by folks who have experience in building businesses that have a key sustainable element, then you're very welcome to take part. And also, if you are planning on starting a business that perhaps doesn't even have a sustainability, a key sustainability focus, you're still welcome as part of the program. So this is not necessarily exclusive to businesses that are wanting to pursue a sustainability element as part of their business. It's open to all. What we're saying is that there will be two tracks. There'll be a track for general founders who are normally part of the Founder Institute wanting to build meaningful and enduring tech companies. And then we have a separate sustainability track. So we'll be running a lot of weeks together and then there'll be some weeks where those who are on the sustainability track, three weeks in fact, where they'll have some additional sessions. So that's the application deadline. Will the next FI program have remote mentors in addition to local? Yes. And that is the intention. So we've had some sustainability mentors in particular who are from out of town. And we recognise that as much as we would love to meet in person, the current circumstances are such that we are meeting remotely. And it's very sad to see some of the news in Melbourne, Victoria today about what's been happening. Uh, questions come in. I, if I'm an investor looking for regtechs to invest in, where can I look? I would suggest that you check out the Regtech Association of Australia. They run, or they're, they're an association that a lot of regtechs are members of, and trying to understand who their members are, and possibly making friends with people who are on that association, because they're likely to have their their ears close to the ground on the nascent reg techs. Another question, what are some of the learning outcomes of the program? As I mentioned before, our program is designed to help you get to traction faster. Because we find great people, we provide them with a devoted support network, and we put them through a structured growth process. So over the course of the program, which runs about 14 weeks, where we meet one night a week. We have a structured curriculum or a structured set of modules that will help ensure that you have the right vision and more importantly, you've validated that vision. 
that you've had conversations and thoughts about customer development, that you've gone through the process of speaking with those customers and understanding what your product development roadmap might look like. You'll then be equipped with a marketing plan so that you have a sense of where you go to next. You'll then have a financial model that's able to support what we've discussed above. And you've also thought about who your potential investors may be if indeed you need financing to help take your business to that next level. And I think the other key outcome that you'll receive as part of the program is an ability to pitch, an ability to explain what your business is, why it is special, why it is differentiated against the competition, and why you are likely to succeed. So the program is a difficult program. <laughs> it's not for the faint-hearted. But I would suggest if you want to build a meaningful and enduring startup, that is not a four-hour work week. And I think you can expect to, to work on your business. They're not assignments that are for some hypothetical or some kind of university case study. You'll be working on growing your business. John has asked, is there a link available to the Right Click Capital Dealbook report? Yes, if, if you have a look in today's Australian Financial Review, there is a chart there that illustrates the, the deals that got funded in the first half of this calendar year. And John, if you can't find that, do hit me up, benjamin.chong at fi.co, benjamin.chong at fi.co, and I'll send you a copy. Ooh, got another question here from Ivan. Thanks for answering my last question. Do you have a link or website where you can raise money for my startup in Indonesia? I would suggest you have a look at the Indonesian Venture Capital Association. The companies that, or the firms that come to mind would be folks that are friends of ours, such as Golden Gate Adventures, who are based in Singapore. I'd have a look at Wavemaker Partners, who are also based in Singapore. And I'd also consider the guys from Mount Kajora, K-E-J-O-R-A, and they're they're friends of mine and they're investing in Indonesia. Good luck with that. Okay, I think that ends a bunch of the questions that I see here. I'll just hold this open for another 30 seconds. If you've got any further questions, really happy to stick around. You can quiz me about anything on the Founder Institute, good, bad and ugly, or funding. And while I'm at it, I can say that at the Founder Institute in Sydney, we're really, really fortunate to have a roster of fantastic co-directors, including Paul Krzyzewski, Chris Clark, Cheryl Mack, Phoebe Zhang, and Charlotte Connell. So these fellow co-directors and I have had a broad range of experience across startups, across corporates, some not-for-profit work as well, and what we are determined to do is help you succeed. So if you've got any further questions about the Founder Institute, please hit me up, benjamin.chong at fi.co, and either one of my fellow co-directors or I will get back to you. And we're very much looking forward to the upcoming semester. And stay tuned. If you want to join any further Founder Institute events, please go to fi.co slash events we've got a couple of events in the coming weeks so i look forward to hearing or seeing you then it's 7 45 have a wonderful tuesday evening